That was uh, beautiful. You know, uh, back in the Jesus uh, Day movement when these hippies were getting saved in Southern California, uh, they would often do songs that they would write just uh, having been redeemed and saved out of a, just a dark background. And instead of, uh, I, uh, they would just, after they were done, they would just do this. Point up to the Lord. Glory to God. And uh, we give glory to God for that. Well, we are, we've embarked on a two-part series starting last Lord's Day on the seven major characteristics of our future glory seen in the very last two chapters of the last book of our Bibles, Revelation 21 and 22. And, and we've done this as, I hope, an encouragement for us as a church to, to encourage us to invest in eternity, especially as, you know, January, February comes along and sort of ministry kicks back in, kicks back in uh, for church ministry here. And, and, and as we look at this new year of ministry, it's good to get a picture of where we're all headed and what we're investing in, why we do what we do to the glory of God. And I hope that this will achieve some of that. Now look, the focus of our study has been really the ultimate destiny, the ultimate destiny of uh, our glory, our, our hope, uh, our destiny as, uh, for all the redeemed. But we talked about last time how what we call heaven really is only an intermediate state. When we die, our soul spirit goes to be with the Lord, and we're present with the Lord, absent from the body, present with the Lord. Uh, and what's going to happen is we live in this sort of uh, incomplete state. We await, after we've gone to be with the Lord, we await for our resurrection. Now, that's going to occur at the rapture of the church. Christ will come in his cloud, 1 Thessalonians 4, and other places, John 14, we read about. And, and the church, those who are alive, are going to be caught up, and those who have already departed, they're sold to be with the Lord, their bodies will be resurrected, and will... Be, the church will be risen and glorified uh, with the Lord. Now, as we understand it here at Fenton Park, that will then be followed by a seven-year tribulation period where God unleashes His wrath upon an unbelieving world, which we see in the book of Revelation, at the end of which Christ comes in His second coming to, uh, to judge and to establish His kingdom. Again, from the book of Revelation, that He will rule and reign on this earth. He'll renew uh, earth into a garden of Eden-like state. And Satan will be put into the bondless pit, unable to deceive the nations. At the end of the thousand years, uh, Satan is released. He deceives the nations once more. Jesus then brings his final judgment and destroys the heaven and the earth and creates a new heavens and the earth. And then finally, what we've been studying in Revelation 21 and 22 is going to come about. So we're talking about the ultimate destiny. However, there is a sense in which what we are studying last, to, last Lord's Day and today is actually something that we're going to see when we go to be with the Lord. Let me show you this really briefly. In John 14, we read it earlier, Jesus promised that in my Father's house are many dwelling places. He doesn't say in my Father's house there will be many dwelling places. Why does he say are? Because they already exist. The Father's house and the dwellings already exist. And he says, if it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. Now, that word prepare doesn't mean to create, doesn't mean to make. It means to make ready. Like if you had someone uh, that you're showing hospitality to, and you make ready a room so that they can come and say, sleep over or whatever. That's the word. He, he, he's gone to make ready the place that already exists. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, talks about our inheritance, which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, is reserved in heaven for you. And the language there is saying that it's already there, it's already reserved, it's there waiting for you. And then we read last time in Revelation 21, verse 2, that uh, this holy city, this new Jerusalem, comes out of heaven. That is what Paul calls the third heaven, the place of God's special presence. And it says that it's having been made ready. 
In other words, it was already ready, and now it just comes out of that holy abode of his special presence and descends upon a new heaven, a new earth. So look, the holy city, the new Jerusalem, the inheritance of 1 Peter, the Father's house of John 14 are all the same thing. And that means that when you die as Christians and you go to be with the Lord, where's the Lord? He's in that holy city. We're going to see that when we go to be with the Lord. So there's a sense in which what we're studying is actually something we're going to see a whole lot sooner than we may have expected. We're studying about our true home. Our citizenship is in heaven. But we look for a city whose architect and builder is God. It's the city of the living God. And last Sunday, we began to look at the seven major characteristics. We saw the first three. We saw how this holy city is set on a new heaven and new earth. We saw how uh, there will be no sin there. There's no uh, emotional effects of sin. There's no bodily effects of sin. There's no environmental effects of sin. There's no Satan. There's no sinners. Just the saints, all glorifying God. The saints of all ages glorifying God, not only singing, but also serving Him in many different ways. But today, in the remaining four characteristics, we focus primarily on the holy city itself. And quite frankly, it's just breathtaking. And I hope it'll encourage you. And there's going to be lessons for us uh, to learn from all of this. And so when we done looking at these characteristics, we'll then look at what these two chapters have to say about the take home of these two chapters. All right, so that's what we're going to do this morning. But let me just give a little brief side note here before we uh, return to our characteristics, to the characteristics here, because a, a, a few people uh, last week and throughout this week have actually mentioned to me how encouraged and how interesting it's been to look at the book of Revelation, because like for them, it seemed like the book of Revelation is like this large, elaborate riddle that you sort of uh, uh, need to try somehow figure out. And, 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 and you know, if you've heard different preachers, or you've read different commentaries. I mean, you know that there are a lot of different views of different things, and basically, uh, it has to do with the difference between how we interpret this book. And, and as you noticed last week, I am interpreting it literally, not literalistically, but literally. Now, why is that? And some have wondered, why? Why do you interpret the book of Revelation literally? Well, look, I, there's a lot more to it, but bottom line, simple as this. In chapter 22, we see this book described four times as prophecy. The prophecy of this book. Prophecy, prophecy, prophecy. In other words, it's not apocalyptic. It's not all just symbols and riddles. No, it is prophecy. And if you want to know how to interpret prophecy, all you got to do is look at how predictions in prophecy have been fulfilled. How were they fulfilled? Literally. Read Isaiah 53 about Christ's first coming. You can't miss it, right? It doesn't mean it doesn't use figurative language. Of course it does. But figurative is not allegorical. And so that's why I take it that way. I know there's different, to take different views, but now you know where I'm coming from. And let me just say one more thing. Chapter 22, verse 7, Jesus says this, Blessed is he who heeds the words of the prophecy of this book. Jesus pronounced a blessing upon those who read it and understand it. And look, you can't heed what you can't understand. This book was meant to be understood. And far from being a book to be intimidated about, Jesus pronounces a blessing on those who read it and heed it. So it's a good thing. And that's where I'm coming from, all right? All right, so let's, let's return. And if you have more questions about that, I'd love to talk to you about it afterwards. But let's go to the fourth major characteristic of the book of Revelation here, of, the, of our future glory here in the book of Revelation, chapter 21. Begin, picking up again at verse 9 of chapter 21. And the fourth major characteristic is this the Shekinah glory of God himself. It says, Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and, and spoke with me, saying, Come here, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. Well, a little interesting side note there, just a couple of chapters earlier in Revelation 19, the bride, the wife of the Lamb is, is described there, it's the church risen and glorified, that's called the bride. But here, the holy city itself, the place where all the redeemed will live, is now called the bride. And then in verse 10, he says, 
And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain. And he showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. <coughs> Her, that is the holy city's brilliance, the shining radiance, was like a very costly stone, as a stone of crystal clear jasper. Now, that's a gem that basically looks like a diamond. So there's this brilliant diamond, bright, shining glory of God emitting from this holy city. Look down at verse 23. <coughs> the city has no need of the sun or of the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God has illumined it, and its lamp is the Lamb. So you see, there's no, there's no need for the sun, there's no need for the moon, or the glory of God, His shining brilliance, is what provides light. Oh, thank you, Jim. So kind. And similarly, in chapter 22, verse 5, and there will no longer be any night, and they will have no need of the light of the lamp, or of the light of the sun, because the Lord God will illumine them. So this means that the very atmosphere of our future glory is the blazing light of God's Shekinah glory. What is this Shekinah glory? Basically, it's the visible representation of God's presence. Uh, God is everywhere present. Uh, but He's a spirit by nature. And spirits don't have a body like a human. And so God manifests his attributes, the sum total of his attributes in a visible way for us to be able to somehow appreciate it. That's this, this brilliant light. And, uh, you know, God is by nature is light. God is light. And uh, we see the same thing in Isaiah chapter 60, verse 19. The prophets prophesied of this as well. He says, no longer will you have the sun for light by day, nor for brightness will the moon give you light but you will have the Lord for an everlasting light. This is also what we read in Colossians chapter 1, verse 12, where it talks about the inheritance of the saints in light. Our inheritance dwells in the light of God's Shekinah glory. Now, what's amazing, though, here in Revelation is in the Old Testament, God's Shekinah glory was hidden behind a pillar of cloud with fire and smoke. Now, there's a reason for that. If he didn't cover his Shekinah glory, it, the, his brilliant holiness would just consume every sinner. So he had to come in the form of a shield of some sort. So he had a pillar of cloud. Well, similarly, when we come to the New Testament, we find that the glory of God was veiled in human flesh, in the person of the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we got a little bit of a glimpse of that, of that glory shining through his humanness on the top of the, uh, the Mount of Transfiguration. Remember that? But what we see here in the new Jerusalem is God's Shekinah glory without a cloud, without smoke, no veil, fully unabated, never-ending, and immediately accessible to all the redeemed for all the ages. It says in 1 Timothy 6, verse 16, that God dwells in unapproachable light. But in the glory to come, that unapproachable light will be approachable by you and me, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that amazing? And for people, this is what makes paradise paradise. This is what makes paradise paradise. And earlier in chapter 21, in verse 3, it says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people and God himself will be among them. Verse 7, he who overcomes will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son, my daughter. And then later in chapter 22, verses 3 and 4, it says, the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, that is the holy city, and they will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. This is what makes paradise, paradise, seeing God, being with God, He being with us for all eternity. 
But if you hear that the centerpiece of future glory is fellowship with God and His beautiful glory and brilliance, if that sounds to you like something boring, if the idea of knowing Him more fully, seeing Him in His glory doesn't thrill your heart now, what does that say about your spiritual state? Jesus said in his high priestly prayer in John 17, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the one true God, and Jesus Christ whom you sent. That is the centerpiece of eternal life. Eternal life isn't just living forever. It's a quality of life, a quality of life centered in a fellowship with God forever. And if that doesn't thrill your heart, if that sounds boring to you, then check your spiritual pulse. Are you sure it's beeping for God? That's what it's all about, folks. And those who have been redeemed and born again, Romans 8 says that His Spirit dwells in us, His Spirit dwells, uh, bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and He calls and moves us to cry out, Abba, Father! See, every redeemed heart is inclined to God, wanting God, desiring God, seeking God. That is our bent. And if that's not your bed, maybe it's because you're still in your sin. You're still unregenerate. You don't have the Holy Spirit. You haven't been born again. It's all just religion. Check your spiritual pulse. This is what it's all about, folks. Now, if, if you do have a heart for God, if this thrills your heart, well, then you're going to like the fifth major characteristic of our future glory, and that's security. Security. Now remember, last time we saw that in the eternal state, there's no Satan, there's no sinners, there's no curse of sin, there's no sinful nature. So what are the possible threats that there could be in this blissful eternal state? None. But even though that's the case, God in His abundant goodness made the new Jerusalem in such a way that it will forever visibly depict absolute security. Let me show you this. Look at verse 12 of chapter 21. This holy city had a great and high wall. No kidding. Because as we're going to see in verse 17, it most likely gives the dimension of the width of this wall. And the width of this wall is 67 meters thick. And if the thickness is proportionate to its height, indeed, it must be great and high. The higher the wall, the more secure, especially in, in terms of ancient uh, civilization. Higher the wall, the more secure. But this one isn't, isn't just high. This one's great and high. A great and high wall means security. So you see, walls aren't so bad. And that's coming from a Mexican-American. Huh? Not only does it have a great high wall, it has 12 gates, and it says, and at each gate are, is an angel. So at the gates are 12 angels. So each gate has an angel guarding it. Now look, one angel in the Old Testament slew 144,000 Assyrians. I think that's pretty secure, don't you think? One angel at every gate. Names are written on them. We talked about this last time. Look at verse 13. These gates, three to the east, three to the north, three to the south, three to the west. And then look down at verse 14. And, and the wall of the city had 12 foundation stones. The stronger the foundation, the stronger the superstructure. And this one has 12. And on them, the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. We talked about that last time. You go down to verse 17. And he measured its wall 72 yards, literally 144 cubits. This is most likely giving us the width. That's 67 meters thick according to human measurements, which are also angelic measurements. Go down to verse 25. In the daytime, he says, for there will be no night there, its gates will never be closed. Now, of course, in an ancient walled city, the gates were closed at night to keep invaders coming in, sneaking in over the, under the cloak of darkness. But since there's no darkness, there's no night. And since there's angel, an angel guarding each gate, there's no need to reason to fear of any kind of threat. And so the gates are perpetually open, and those open gates for all eternity show just how secure the place is. So all of this, the walls and the, and the, and the gates and the angel and, 
And all this is a visual showing us of our eternal security in that eternal state. As Hebrews 12, 28 says, we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken. That's the picture here. Security. Security. But not only that, we also see the sixth characteristic, spectacular beauty in this holy city. Spectacular beauty. This beauty is seen, first of all, in its symmetry. Did you pick it up as we were reading? Go, go back to verse 12. Do this again. You see the symmetry in the re repetition of the word 12, or derivatives of 12. He says it had a great and high wall with 12 gates, and at the angels, 12 angels. Names were written, them, written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. There were three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, three gates on the west, three plus three plus three plus three, 12. Verse 14, and the wall of the city had 12 foundation stones. On them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Verse 15, the one who spoke to me with, with, had a, uh, a gold measuring rod to measure the city and its gates and its walls, and the city is laid out as a square, and its length is as great as its width. In other words, it's a perfect cube. It's a perfect cube. Now, if you peek down to verse 22, you see this. I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. Interesting. Did you know that in the tabernacle, Solomon's temple, Zerubbabel's temple, uh, and then in Ezekiel, he talks about the rebuilt temple in the millennial kingdom. In every one of those temples, the temple has two major compartments. One, that's the front sanctuary, that's called the holy place. And then on the inner sanctuary, it's called the most holy place, or the holy of holies. Did you know that the holy of holies in every single one of those temples was exactly the same dimension, nine meters cubed? The fact that there's no temple here seems to indicate that this holy city is basically one large holy of holies. But instead of nine meters cubed, he says, and he measured the city with the rod 1,500 miles, literally 12,000 stadia. One stadia equals 185 meters. That means 2,220 kilometers cubed, folks. 2,220 kilometers and its length and width and height are equal. Now, just to get your head around how huge this is, if this holy city was placed on our current earth, its height would reach all the way into our exosphere, right? Now, the exosphere, if you know the different strata of the atmosphere, is the last most layer just before you get to outer space. Now, that's how high it would reach. And then if you were just to look at one side of this holy city, 2,220 kilometers high and wide, you could fit over 18 New Zealands on that. And then if you take the whole volume of 2,220 kilometers cubed, it equates to 12.9 billion cubic kilometers. Some have estimated that you could house well over 100 billion just at the ground level alone. But imagine how many levels you could have in 2,220 kilometer high cube thing. Amazing. This is massive. And he measured its walls, 72 yards, literally 144 cubits, that's 12 times 12. So you see 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12. All these showing a symmetry in God's design. But listen, Obviously, then, the holy city has specific dimensions, right? It has walls. It has, it has sides. It has gates. It has foundations. So you got to get out of your head this whole notion that the heaven, that the eternal destiny is just some kind of nebulous, uh, amorphous, floating, cloud-like place with a single golden gate and St. Peter standing by it. Hardly that at all. This is a beautiful, symmetrical, holy city. 
But its beauty is also seen in its spectrum of colors. Look at verse 18, 21, chapter 21. He says the material of the wall was jasper. This is, again, that diamond-like translucent gem. And the city was pure gold like clear glass. Now, what kind of gold is that that can be translucent? Well, we don't know. This is an absolutely pure kind of gold. And why, though, is it translucent? Well, it contributes to allowing the glory of God to shine through it. The walls, streets, uh, these are all made with that translucent kind of gem, allowing the shining glory of God to, to, to go through it. But it's not all going to be crystal-like and like a giant light bulb because it says in verse 19, the foundation stones of the city were, of the wall were adorned with every kind of precious stone. Now get this, and we try to do our best research to find out what these stones look like, the color. I put them on the screen. You can see it. The first foundation stone was jasper. That's like a diamond-like thing. But then the second one is sapphire. That's like a blue. The third is uh, a chalcedony, chalcedony, which is a grayish green. The fourth is emerald, like a bright green. The fifth is sardonyx, which is like a red, orange, and brown. The sixth is the sardius, sardius which is a shade of red. The seventh is crystal light, which is yellowish. The eighth is beryl, which is sort of green-blue. The ninth is topaz, which is yellow-green. And, and the tenth is uh, crystal phase, which is... Uh, a golden green, and the eleventh is jacinth, which is violet. The the twelfth is amethyst, which is like purple. You can see that every color of the rainbow is represented there. And then to add to that, verse 21, there's large pearly white gates. Verse 21, the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each one of the gates was a single pearl, massive pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. This is why John earlier in chapter 21, verse 2, said that the city was adorned as a bride for her husband. Beautiful color. Beautiful symmetry. Don't, don't think that eternity is just one huge giant light bulb. There's color. There's beauty. This amazing, amazing thing. It's hard to even to imagine it all. But let's look at the last characteristic here. This is startling. We've seen the, the super uh, amazing beauty, spectacular beauty and security. But seventh, we see the supernatural enrichment. Now, we talked about verses 22 to 27 of chapter 21 uh, last time. Let's now pick it up in chapter 22, verses 1 and 2, where we see the river of life, the first supernatural enrichment. He says, then... He showed me a river of the water of life. In other words, it has life-giving properties. And it's clear as crystal, sparkling clear, absolutely pure. And it is coming from, this is ever flowing out like a spring from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Just a side note there, notice there's only one throne. Shows you the triunity of God. Verse 2, in the middle of its street, that is a city street. So apparently the river of life will flow in the middle of the main pathway headed toward the throne of God. But here's the question, why a river of life-giving properties when we'll already have eternal life, will already be in our resurrected bodies built to last forever? Why? Well, I think we get a clue later in chapter 22 in verse 17, where the call goes out and says, let's the one who is thirsty, come. Now, we lose it in English, but in the original, it's saying this, let the one who is thirsty keep coming. This isn't just drinking once. This is drinking and drinking and drinking and drinking throughout all eternity. Let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who wishes take the water of life without cost. This may very well imply, listen, that the very means by which you and I will be able to live forever in eternity with God is by drinking of this water of life, which is interesting. Because look, God is almighty, right? He's all-powerful. He can do whatever he desires. But God is also a God who likes to use means to achieve his ends. And it could very well be that this is the means to achieve that end. And what a beautiful picture it would be 
that for all eternity, as we drink from this river of life, it shows the picture of our eternal dependence on Him. Why? Because this water comes from where? His very throne. He is the source of life. And out comes this water perpetually for all eternity. And we go and we drink and we continue to live forever in perfect dependence on our Creator. And that is the way it should have been for all eternity. That's the way it should have been in the garden. We're creatures. We're always going to be dependent on our Creator. And for all eternity, this river of life and us drinking from it will depict that. But that's not the only source of life. There's also, verse 2, the tree of life. He says, on either side of the river was the tree of life. Now, interesting, the, the picture here in the language here is saying that this tree, this one tree, is in the middle of both the river and the street. So you see the picture up there might be a way of depicting it. But the question is, is this the tree of life from the Garden of Eden? Or is this its heavenly counterpart? We don't know. It could be either one. But just like the tree of life in the Garden of Eden, you remember that uh, when Adam and Eve sinned, uh, they were forbidden, and the angel with a sword that goes every direction prevented them from taking and eating of the tree of life. Why do you say? Because if they eat it, they will live forever. So he had to guard them from that. And so this tree of life is a means of living forever. But it's more than that. It's got to be. Why? Because it says it bears 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. It is a fruit of the month tree. It's not seasonal. It's monthly. Now, look, there seems to be no reason for such a variety except for our pure enjoyment of the goodness of God. You say, wait a minute, so are we going to be eating and drinking? I thought we are going to be resurrected and all that kind of stuff. And Well, yeah. Didn't Jesus? Remember that? When he, after he was crucified, he was buried, and he risen from, rose from the dead, and they didn't believe it was him. And, and, so, and so he says, okay, give me some of that fish. And so he ate it in front of them. And in Acts chapter 1, he says, we saw him. We ate and we drank with the risen Lord. So yeah, we're going to be eating and drinking just like Jesus did. Amazing. But there's more to this tree of life because it says, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Healing? Healing of what? I mean, we saw last time that there's no sickness, there's no disease, there's no curse. So healing of what? Well, here's where, again, the original helps us. This Greek word, I'll give it to you, and you see what it sounds like. Therapeia. What does that sound like? Therapy, right? That's where we get our English word therapeutic. And this word can mean to provide a remedy for sickness, can also mean to improve your life. That's the idea here. Maybe it's sort of like a a holy long black. I hope it is. I love coffee. Or maybe, you know, a chai tea. I don't know. Or maybe it's kind of like a heavenly red bull. You know that? You know, they say red bull gives you wings. Well, this probably gives you rockets. I don't know. You can only imagine, right? I mean, I don't know, but that's what it's saying. Isn't that amazing? So many beautiful glimpses of our eternal home. And there you go. Seven major spectacular characteristics of our true eternal home. But before we leave, we've got to know the take-home. What's the take-home of all this? This is our true home, but what's the take-home? Well, in these two chapters, it contains seven important affirmations that drive home our take-home. And some of these have particular relevance to believers, some to those who don't know the Lord Jesus. Let's begin to look at these just briefly. We only have time to go through these briefly. Let's begin with Christians. Number one, take-home is this. Your hope is sure. Your hope is sure. In the beginning of these two chapters, towards the beginning of these two chapters, in chapter 21, verses uh, 5 and 6, it says this. God says, write, for these words are faithful and true. And then he said, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And then towards the end of our two chapters, in chapter 22, verse 6, it says, and he said to me, that is the angel, these words are faithful and true. Repeating. 
Verse 13, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. You see, God wants us to rest assured that the testimony of our eternal home is faithful and true. And it's backed by the very own divine nature of Christ, who is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ, your hope is sure. But the question for us is, do we believe it? Do we really believe that? Or is it still some faint sort of, eh, well, it'll pan out as it does. No. we got to believe more. Because that's going to shape your priorities in the here and now. Secondly, not only is your hope sure, your hope is near. Your hope is near. Look at chapter 22, verse 6. He says, And the Lord, the God of the, of the spirits of the prophets, sent his angel to show to his bondservants the things which must soon take place. Now, this is referring to the entire book of Revelation. And uh, starting in chapter 4, it began to give us the future, the things that are yet future to us, including the seven-year tribulation, the second coming, the millennial kingdom, the new heavens and the earth. But these string of events all begin with Christ coming, and that's why verse 7 says, And behold, I am coming quickly. You realize that between now and the rapture of the church, there are no signs. He could come today. He could come tomorrow. There's nothing that has to be or there to before the fulfillment of the rapture of the church. There are signs regarding his second coming. We'll see those in the tribulation period. We won't. We'll be with the Lord, but the people on earth will see that. So we need to be ready today. Our hope is near. It all begins with the rapture of the church, which can happen any time. Are you ready? Are you ready? And uh, number three... Number three, your hope is a reason to rejoice. Christian, your hope is a reason to rejoice. Uh, two blessings are pronounced in chapter 22 upon the Christian. And he says, uh, verse 7, Blessed is he who heeds the words of the prophecy of this book. Verse 14, Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter the, by the gates into the city. What does that mean, though, blessed? We use it. And I think we often mean today, oh, we're so blessed, we mean it's some kind of material, temporal blessing. Oh, I, I got a great job, or oh, you know, we're well off, or we're, you know, and we mean it in a more earthly sense. That is not the biblical sense of the term. Blessed means this, it means to have grounds for transcendent joy. Grounds for transcendent joy. It's transcendent because it doesn't depend on our temporal circumstances. It transcends the temporal. It transcends the earthly, and therefore it is a perpetual grounds for continuous joy. That's what it means. You could translate it like this. What grounds for transcendent joy has the person who heeds the words of the prophecy of this book? What grounds for transcendent joy have those who wash their robes so they may enter the, uh, they may enter the city through its gates? So our hope on the basis of Christ's word and redeeming work is a reason to rejoice. But we must heed the word. We must believe. We must make sure that we've washed our robes. Say, well, if that's true, why is it that I don't feel so joyful? I'll tell you why. Because maybe you've taken your eyes off of what truly is the basis of a transcendent joy, and that is a home, a city, whose builder and maker is God, who will never be shaken, which will never be shaken, it's an eternal, secure hope. You get your eyes on that, that inheritance laid up for us, which is undefiled, and it is reserved up in heaven for you. You get your eyes on your eternal hope, folks, and you will have joy. You get your eyes on the temporal, the here and now, the earthly. We're living in a fallen world. We live in fallen bodies. We're going to have aches and pains. We're going to get sick. We're going to eventually die. But our hope isn't here, right? We're just pilgrims of passing through. Number four, not only is it a reason to, uh, <clears throat> to rejoice, but fourthly, it's a reason to worship God. It's a reason to worship God. Uh, look at uh, verse 8 and 9 of chapter 22, and look at John's response to all this. He says, I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. 
And when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed me these things. Now, he was so overwhelmed by what he saw, so thrilled, so overtaken by it all, that he got a little bit beside himself and began to worship the angel who showed him these things. But look at the angel's response, verse 9. But he said to me, don't do that. I'm just your fellow servant and, and, and a servant of your brethren, the prophets, and a servant of those who heed the words of this book. Worship God. You want to worship? Worship God. And we look at that, we sort of chuckle and say, oh, crazy John. There he is. But look, we're talking about the Apostle John here. John, it wasn't some kind of fickle kind of guy. He wasn't some kind of frivolous kind of guy. So for him to be driven to such an amazing, overwhelming response, how overwhelming must our eternal hope be, right? I mean, he was so overwhelmed, he didn't get beside himself. What else can we do but heed the call to worship God? He didn't say. A fifth take-home is your hope is not only reason to rejoice, to worship God, but also to persevere in godliness. Persevere in godliness. Look at chapter 22, verse 10. And he said to me, Do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. And in light of its imminence, verse 11, and he says this in the middle of the verse, Let the one who is righteous still practice righteousness, and the one who is holy still keep himself holy. Now, he's not saying this is what you need to do to get saved. He's not saying what you need to do to stay saved. He's just saying he wants us to keep manifesting that we're saved. You see the difference? Keep manifesting the fruit of genuine salvation. Why? Because it's possible for someone to think they're a Christian, to think they're headed for glory, and be absolutely wrong. So what we got to do is what Peter the Apostle told us to do similarly in chapter 1, verse 10 of Second Peter, where he says, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing of you. You need to make certain that you truly are born again, no kidding around, kidding around, top of the drawer, blue ribbon, born again Christian. You got to make sure. How do you do that? Paul Peter says, add to your faith virtue, virtue self-control. And he lists off all these things. You should be seeking to manifest the fruit of salvation in your life. Again, not to get saved, not to keep saved, but to manifest that you're saved so that you don't deceive yourself. And that leads us to the next application, number six. Because the first half of verse 11, what does it say? Let the one who does wrong still do wrong, and the one who is filthy still be filthy. This is what is called a prophetic-style taunt. It's, it's kind of like saying this. Because this eternal future is so certain, go ahead and see what happens if you keep on doing wrong, you keep on insisting being filthy and refusing God's only provision of cleansing. Just see what's going to happen. And verse 12 and 15, it tells us what it is. Behold, I am coming quickly. My reward is with me to render to every man according to what he has done. Judgment. Judgment is coming. And then he says what's going to happen to those who are unbelievers. Verse 15 Outside, that is outside the holy city, are the dogs and the sorcerers and the immoral people and the murderers and the idolaters and everyone who practices a lie. These are all unbelievers. What is this showing us? It's all showing us that if you don't repent and trust in Christ, your eternal judgment is certain. Your eternal judgment is certain. That should sober us up. You say, well, where is this outside? We saw this last time. Chapter 21, verse 8, it's the place in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone. The lake of fire. This is the final destiny of all who have rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a place of eternal torment. Jesus said it's a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth, a place of outer darkness, even though it is a flame and a fire that causes torment. Jesus called it everlasting punishment. That's where unbelievers will go. 
And that destiny is just as sure as the destiny for the redeemed. Where are you at? Where are you at with the Lord? Jesus said, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world, yet lose his soul? Don't gamble. Make things right with God today. And this leads us to the last point, because there's good news. Yes, if you haven't repented and trusted in Christ, your eternal judgment is certain. But the good news is your salvation is certain if you come to Christ for the free water of life. In chapter 22, verse 16 and 17, he says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David is the promised Messiah, the Savior, the King. He's the bright morning star that is the brightest shining star because he's the most holy one, the most glorious one. He's the only one who has the right to redeem us. Verse 17, the Spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears, come. And let the one who is thirsty, come. Are you thirsty this morning? Do you thirst to be delivered from the penalty of your sin in, in the lake of fire? Do you just thirst to be with God in this holy city that we've seen? Then he says, let the one who wishes, desires, take the water of life without cost. You can't ever earn enough brownie points to get into this eternal city. You never can, and you won't be able to, and you don't have to. Why? Because Christ paid it all. He paid it all. And what's your response? Come. Why would you delay? Come. Freely he offers it. Let's pray. Dear God, we do thank you. The wonder of the glory of our eternal hope. But we do beg you, if there's anyone here that doesn't know you, if they would hear, that you would open up their eyes to see the filthiness of their garment before you, the holy God, that they would come and dip their robes in the blood of Christ, his redeeming work on the cross in our place, that they may have washed robes and have the right to enter this holy city. And Lord, we know that none of us ever could take any credit or glory for our admittance into this holy city because we also are sinners. We deserve the lake of fire. That's what we deserve. Only by your grace will we be able to enter this wonder, wonderful, glorious place. Thank you for that hope. I pray, Lord, that you would give us time, even this week, to meditate on these things, to ponder these things, to let it really sink in so that we truly believe and know the certainty of our hope, that we, it would move us to rejoice and to worship you, that it would cause us to get serious about our service to you and our love for you, our worship of you, and, and making Christ known, Lord, that we would go bearing the wonderful news of the good news of Jesus Christ, offered to sinners to come. Thank you, Lord. We bless you. We praise you. In Christ's name.